Well, well, thank you. Um, citizen sheep was a was what they call a Freudian slip, I think, perhaps in in the context of this debate after what we've heard from from Jeff and his um, his wonderful presentation. Once upon a time in a galaxy far, far away. Um, but but be afraid, please be very afraid. I was once called um, the most dangerous woman in Britain by the Sun newspaper. I a little titter here in, in Leeds, but when you go to the great city of Liverpool, you get a standing ovation for that. Um, but, but sadly, I was robbed of that title by the Daily Mail newspaper last year in the run-up to the general election, where it was suggested that uh, that title had now been taken by a charismatic politician north of the border. And to, yeah, and to add insult to injury, the First Minister of Scotland is actually a little bit younger than me as well. So dangerousness, dangerousness. I, I think of the internet, of course, as the most extraordinary innovation. I think of it as exciting and democratizing, like the printing press. Like the printing press, plus, plus, plus. But there is, as we've heard, the dark side. And I'm sure that, you know, all those years ago, people sat and thought, the printing press, we cannot, we cannot have this. All these ideas and all this wicked information and sedition and revolution is going to be spread by this technology. And, uh, you know, to some extent, there's a legitimate fear in that. But equally, where would we be? Where would we be without the, the printing press? And that's how I try to, to, to approach this debate whilst knowing and realizing that there is also the dark side too. And the dark side, as we know, is that this is a new frontier, this is a new space in which, well, on, on the one hand, citizens, um, not citizen sheep, but, but active citizens can communicate with each other, can have a much more level playing field around information and history and the ability to organize and come together without the need to be mediated by, by powerful interests. Incredibly exciting, exciting things. Wonderful, potentially, for democracy. But on the other side of the equation, bad stuff can happen online. We know this. It can happen in the real world, it can happen in the virtual world. We can see the spread of, of hate and conspiracy and pornography and all, and, and frankly, an incivility, an incivility, a coarseness, a harshness of language and debate. These people who are so brave and rude and hateful online, they wouldn't dream of doing it to your face in in the pub. I know because I've occasionally been on the receiving end of it and there is a there is a gender issue there too that we might we we might I explore in terms of the trolling and so on. So, you know, there's the yin and yang to the virtual world as there is to the real world. And then you have then you have societal responses to to the yin and yang of this exciting new space and technology and world really, world. And um if Mrs. May were, were standing here, the Home Secretary, she would um, be able to, to, to make you incredibly afraid. And, and there is, there's lots to be afraid of. We talked about it in terms, of, in terms of crime and terrorism and so on. And she would no doubt make a very compelling case for something like the Investigatory Powers Bill. And I would say this is disproportionate. This is blanket surveillance, not on not on small groups of suspects or even individuals. This is entire populations. This is entire populations. And she, you know, I'm, try I'm trying to do it fairly here because I'm, I'm by myself, she would say, but, but Shami, bad stuff happens uh, online and this cannot be an ungoverned space like Somalia or Afghanistan, something like that. There, you know, we have to clamp down on that ungoverned space. And I would say in response, yes, we do have to create ethics and politics and law and civility online as we do in in the real world but um but you know bad stuff happens in the real world too and and i fear that what is being proposed and what has been perpetrated before it's even been proposed and i'm sorry but edward snowden is a hero to me you could some people call him a traitor and some people call him uh, a public interest whistleblower and i am in the latter camp unashamedly 
Because what has been perpetrated, and it's now being retrospectively argued that it should be made legal, is this blanket surveillance on entire populations without public debate, let alone consent, let alone parliamentary involvement, let alone law. But the counter-argument, Shami, bad stuff happens online. My argument, bad stuff happens in the real world too. And um, if you think about a, a house, think about a domestic dwelling, you know, these wonderful old townhouses in great cities like Leeds where we are today, I promise you that a domestic dwelling that's been used that way for more than a few years has been a crime scene. It just has, right? Maybe a little bit of uh, a little bit of, you know, benefit fraud or tax evasion or conspiracy to this, that, and the other. Maybe something worse: a common assault, a more serious act of violence, or sex crime. You think about these beautiful old houses, however large or small, that have been used that way for decades and hundreds of years. They have been crime scenes. And my argument is that what is being proposed for the virtual world is the equivalent of saying, look, we now have this amazing, cool digital technology. We have the capacity to change the legal and physical architecture of our country, perhaps our world, to require, to require the placing of cameras and microphones in everyone's home, in the living room, in the bedroom, why not? Why not? But don't worry, we're not, we're not, you're not so interesting. We're not actually going to watch and listen in real time to all your boring football whatever talk. We're just going to store it up just in case. And we'll look at it retrospectively if somebody complains that you've um, committed a crime or something untoward has happened in your home. Or perhaps we'll use um, keywords or algorithm, uh, algorithms or other ways of looking at your life on a random basis. Right? And there's no problem with that, surely, Mrs. May might argue, because the innocent have nothing to fear, nothing to hide, nothing to fear. This is what is being peddled to the population. This is what is being peddled to the population population and that's just by the state and you give me knowing looks and, and like Jeff I get a very different response from a more mainstream less technologically literate audience and that's kind of the problem that we're that we're talking about and of course it's not just big brother, brother state that I'm sort of talking about and, 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 and perhaps big brother corporates that, that Jeff's been talking about. We can be pretty unkind little brothers and sisters to each other as well. You think about young people and you know the, the stuff that they will post online about their girlfriends and boyfriends or, or just the, the mistakes that they make about themselves as if tomorrow will never come and they'll never be going for that job interview in years to come where um, you know, what they wore and what they did last summer is probably a little embarrassing. And I do worry about this experimental generation. Because it'll be all right in the end, like the printing press broadly was. Broadly was. I mean, there are you know, certain columnists that we could do without, but we'll, you know. The printing press turned out broadly all right. And I, I, and I believe, I am an optimist. I, I, I know I don't always come across as a, an optimist because I get very grim and worthy. I just can't help it and wear black and so on. But, um, but I had some really, really good advice, actually, not from a lawyer or a politician or a journalist, but a scientist some years ago who said, after I'd given some grim and worthy speech about the war on terror, and ID, ID, cards, were, ID cards were talked about in a lovely nostalgic way in... in, in in, in my introduction. This is the woman from the last millennium who campaigned against I identity cards. Yes, big deal, Shami. You know, we fought identity cards. We eventually got them defeated. And, and, in, and why did we fight identity cards? Because we knew that they would be really bad for race relations. They would be a pass law in our inner cities. And we fought identity cards because of the great big database that was going to sit 
behind the identity card. A database that was going to grow and grow, inevitably containing all sorts of unspecific data about people um, and, and, and the holders of the data would know what was there and the person holding this little identity card would not. And it was going to be terrible for people's privacy and liberty and we eventually got that legislation defeated in and overturned in 2010. Well done, Shami. Well done, civil liberties campaigners. And of course, in my bag, I'm carrying the same identity card plus, plus, plus as Adam over here, who's just had it sprayed all over the screen. And I pay for the privilege. And it talks to my other devices and probably his devices, and it'll be on Channel 4 News tomorrow night. So, so, so well done, you know. So, this, um, this, this debate is actually the new frontier of human rights debate, I think, in our country and in the world. Younger people are living more intimately, more intimately online than in the real world. You need a magistrate's warrant to search someone's home or office. And you'll go into this teenage bedroom and find the smelly socks and whatever. The, you know, the, the leftover pizza under the bed or whatever it is. That's. But, but, but go to somebody's smartphone, go to somebody's devices, go, go to what's behind the black box, as Jeff said, and you have the most intimate picture of someone's life. Their financial information, their shopping preferences, their friends, their friends' contact details, their location information, where they've been and who they've been with. And you've just been with the second most dangerous woman in Britain. <laughs> so be afraid in the wrong hands. That's, that's your job prospects. You, you wanted to apply to, you wanted to be at GCHQ, anyway. <laughs> so um, so this, you know, this is incredibly important. And like Jeff, I fear the complacency of, of, of too many people. This is an incredibly important debate for the, the future of the world. It's, not a, it's no longer a niche debate. We all love the cool technology, but I suspect it's your community and your profession who are best equipped to lead it. I was, I was saying a little earlier that you know all professions have a choice. The choice to be the keepers of the knowledge and the power and the information. You only get to God via me, once said the clerics. And I'm a sort of recovering lawyer. No, actually only in remission because you never recover. But we sometimes do the same as lawyers. You've got a very difficult legal problem. I won't translate the law for you. I will just complicate it so that I get paid lots of money to, to tell you what the answer is. That's, that's bad ethics and bad professionalism. In my view, the best professionals are the ones who translate the Latin into English for the clients and the customers and the people. And the people. Forget the clients and the customers and all of that language. The people. And this debate has to be a multidisciplinary debate. The, um, the law and the politics and the ethics and the philosophy needs to catch up, needs to catch up, and it's so lagging behind the, uh, the cool technology and the commercial interests and the state interests that will use it one way rather than the other. And I'm not against it. I just want ordinary people to be empowered to play their part in this debate. And I, I suspect the only people who are going to do that are you. And once you've done that, then we can have a truly multidisciplinary citizenship rather than citizenship conversation about where the boundaries should be, whether you're of Mrs. May's view or whether you are of mine. Whether you support targeted surveillance or blanket surveillance, you know, wherever the boundary should be. You know, privacy in particular can seem like a very bourgeois human right when set against, you know, the right not to be enslaved or tortured and, and, and so on. But, but it's so important. If you don't have privacy, how do you have proper medical provision? 
with no confidentiality. If you don't have privacy, how do you have a, a, a proper financial system or banking system? How do you have freedom of thought, conscience, and religion, and even freedom of speech? As we've discussed, some people are much braver about their speech when they're anonymous. How do you have democracy without secret ballots? So um, it can seem like a, like a, trivial, a trivial thing but actually, it's essential to intimacy, dignity, and trust between people. It can't be absolute. We're social creatures. The moment we come together, we give up a little, a little privacy, and we do it in places called families and communities and workplaces and society. But, but the interference should be proportionate, and we should know what it is we're signing up for, and that's, what I think, what we don't. We're talking just... You know, before I end my little provocation, we're talking about the consequence of, of information without borders for society. And society now is an international society. So we can't have this debate in relation to you know, one little corner of, of the globe. To return to Edward Snowden, one of the, the, the many important things he revealed and the responses to his revelation revealed is that governments on both sides of the Atlantic thought they were justified in behaving the way they did um, by, by reference to over there and foreign jurisdictions. So they had tighter privacy protections for their own kingdom or state but had a very, very lax regime in relation to what we can do over there. And you will know, as techie people, that that is a nonsense when it comes to, to this space. And so the moment a server is over there, they were saying, well, the you know, domestic law doesn't apply. I will use my James Bond license to kill regime because this is a foreign jurisdiction. Which means that the, the debate about internet internet privacy versus surveillance is right up there with the, with the biggest fundamental debates about human rights on the planet today. This is a shrinking, interconnected planet because of the internet, because of climate change, because of desperate people drowning in the Mediterranean. And we can't do this segmenting anymore. We are going to have to fight for um, principles that are of universal application and we're going to have to apply them that way. But we're not even at the starting blocks yet. And as I say, the population doesn't even have the language to, to, to enter into that debate without your help. And this was just the, this was just the privacy citizenship piece. We didn't, haven't got into um, how this technology is changing people's lives in the intimate sphere the huge proportion of people who take their phones to bed, the, the ways in which this technology might be changing their intimate behavior, making them less able to look at each other in the eye, or, or I don't know, to do all those things that you know, we used to do in the Jurassic era, like actually pull someone in a bar and not online. I don't know, I can't remember. So it's, um, it's, it, 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 it's a huge conversation that you are able to have and you are able to translate. And, and I, I believe it will probably be professionals from your community that, uh, that are best, better equipped than lawyers or politicians or even, dare I say it, journalists. To, if, if you're prepared to share this knowledge and this language and decode it, if code is the new Latin, you have to choose what kind of cleric you're going to be, and I hope that you're going to be. I hope you're going to be the the, uh, the professionals that empower the people and, and and make make this ethical, political, and legal debate rational, and human, and possible. Thank you for listening. Thank you.